Uh, up first, we have Eden Dhaliwal from Outlier Ventures, uh, talking about the role of tokens in crypto economics and Web3. So let's welcome the speaker. Cool. So thanks for joining. My name is Eden from Outlier Ventures. I'm here to talk about the role of tokens uh, and crypto economics in Web3. Um, for those who might not be familiar with Outlier Ventures, uh, we're an early stage investor uh, in next generation protocols. Um, we were probably one of the first thesis-led investors in this space, and our, our thesis is called Convergence. And so um, Convergence is uh, where we see new digital economies forming at the intersections of blockchains and other emerging tech like AI and IoT. What I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about why Web3 is important. Um, in order to understand why we need a Web3, it helps to kind of go through you know, some of the problems with Web 2.0. And so, firstly, I think a big problem with the current internet is just that open source has failed. It just, it's not a viable business model. It's, uh, it relies too much on altruism, uh, and it just doesn't scale. Secondly, um, the lack of universal standards for securing and sharing metadata has just allowed big companies, tech companies, um, to aggregate and silo this data. And so the hoarding of this data has, um, has created these data, these centralized data monopolies. And, um, you know, it's effectively made these companies the gatekeepers of privacy and security. And so we know that data aggregation, data monetization, it's a hugely successful business model. Right? It's so much so that the internet's pretty much, today the internet creates winner-take-all categories. So uh, Google owns search, Facebook owns social, uh, Amazon owns e-commerce. And so, you know, part of, part of this outcome has been that users just really haven't had an option to, to allocate or use their data. It's just, it's had really no value to to us as users. And so it's given the, um, the ability for these tech companies to walk in and, and really um, you know, own, own this data, monopolize it to the point where they're not just data monopolies anymore, they're turning into AI monopolies. And so the insights that they're generating are becoming deeper and deeper in terms of the personal and consumer identities that they're establishing on us. And so it's only recently been, um, you know, an issue for us as users, um, you know, pretty much after um, things like uh, the Equifax hack and um, uh, Cambridge Analytica, where us as users are actually starting to feel that vulnerability of big tech companies, companies in general, um, you know, holding our data and us being sort of vulnerable to that, that privacy and that security that, that we, you know, rely on them to kind of, uh, you know, ensure. And so at Outlier, we've, um, we've kind of mapped out what Web3 looks like, um, you know, from, from our standpoint. And, um, you know, we've kind of based it on um, OSI standards, and we call it the convergence stack. And so this stack is really a convergence of three overarching technologies. It's blockchains, Internet of Things, and um, artificial intelligence. And so we think Web3 is going to enable you know, new forms of value, new data economies, new machine economies, where Internet of Things is going to proliferate data production. Blockchains are going to um, open source verify and secure this data, and then ultimately AI is going to develop valuable insights for automation and data consumption. 
Now, with every new disruptive technology comes with it new and disruptive business models. And, you know, we don't look at tokens as crypto assets. We kind of view tokenization as a business model that's going to enable uh, open source as a viable business model where, where it just, you know, doesn't, doesn't work in today's current internet. And so the way tokens are going to enable the open source business model is through not just the incentivization of network participation, but the enablement of new roles, new actors, where it would be very difficult to kind of create in, uh, in conventional economies. The second, um, you know, the second value or role of tokens is in developing uh, an internet that has carrots, both carrots and sticks. And so right now we've got this internet that's, that's super seamless and it's effectively just enab en enabling the spamming of bad actors. So, you know, it's, it, you think of things like fake news and you think of things like um, cyberbullying. This is, you know, a, a, a result of an internet that's all carrots and no sticks. So there's no discipline in, on this, in, this, in, in, this, in the current internet. With tokens, you can actually start to create new, on, new user behaviors and um, market behaviors. And so those behaviors... Uh, you can incentivize them, but you can also create disincentives, and you can actually keep an accounting of those behaviors so that you're not going to get, um, well, you're going to reduce the amount of, you know, you could say spamming of bad actors. And so, you know, there's effectively three classifications of tokens. There's um, cryptocurrencies and crypto commodities which are, you know, essentially act as a store of value and, and sometimes a, a medium of exchange. Um, there's utility tokens, which are tokens that are used in a decentralized network primarily to provision and acquire digital goods and services. And usually utility tokens are attached to an incentive system. And then lastly, there's security tokens, and uh, security tokens are really, um, you know, represent the value of an underlying asset um, and, and provide an additional value of liquidity, divisibility, transferability. And of course, within these categories are more diversification of tokens. Um, you know, within store of value and medium of exchange, you have stable coins, which are tokens that are pegged to fiat to provide a more stable medium of exchange. There's payment tokens, which are pretty much just tokens that are um, uh, based, uh, that are in a network solely for the pay, uh, purpose of acquiring, paying for digital goods and services. Within utility tokens, you have governance tokens, which allow you to vote on how the network will develop. Discount tokens, which uh, provide the rights to a discount uh, on, uh, on acquiring, paying for digital goods and services. You have work tokens. Work tokens um, require service providers, service operators to stake on their work to ensure um, execution and quality of their work. And then lastly, burn and mint, where tokens are burned, um, uh, tokens are burned after usage in the network, and um, tokens are reintroduced, minted in a dynamic inflation process. And so at Outlier, we've actually spent the last two years um, co-creating crypto economies with portfolio companies and, um, 
uh, and with Imperial College of London. Um, and what, what's come out of that two years of work is actually what's probably the first um, innovation methodology for creating a, t a token economy. And so it's a handbook that we've created. Um, it's called Token Ecosystem Creation. And, you know, one of the first lessons in sort of going about this type of work is just that there's, there's really, you know, maybe with the exception of maybe 12 polymaths in the world, there's no such thing as a crypto economics expert. To do this work, you actually need um, a multidisciplinary team, um, you know, a team of, um, you know, behavioral economists, um, machine learning uh, data scientists, um, product developers, uh, systems engineers, and together, together you can kind of work towards being a, a team that is expert in crypto economics, but, but there isn't going to be somebody that you could just give them a hat and say, okay, you figure it out, you're going to be the crypto economics guy. It just doesn't work that way. So our process actually has three phases. We've mapped it across um, other sort of important um, uh, work streams. So um, we've mapped it across uh, the tech technical documentation that a project should sort of make public, uh, the fundraising process, although this is a little bit outdated, um, you know, workshops and sort of uh, intensive work that needs to be done in person because there's a lot of of course, decentralized teams, distributed teams. And so um, this process has three phases. It has a discovery phase where teams should work together to, to, to really define what the problem is that they're trying to solve. What is the goal of the economy? And understand the stakeholders that are involved in that economy. And the design phase is actually where a lot of the um, mechanism design, game theoretics, uh, consensus algorithms, all of the details, all of the components that you would, you would um, bring together to, to kind of create this qualitative design. And then lastly, it's, it's deployment where um, um, you go through this phase of uh, token design and transfer into a new phase of token optimization where we're validating the principles that we created in the, token, in the design phase. And so over, this, over this, uh, this process, you kind of go from creating design constraints to moving into a, a qualitative design to moving into a mathematical model and then into machine learning and systems engineering to sort of optimize the token and the network. And, you know, the direction, the, the goal that we're, the, uh, you know, that we're headed, where we, what we want to accomplish is actually two types of fit here. And so, you know, we want to accomplish, we want to, be able to establish what's called ledger market fit. And so ledger market fit refers to the computational and technical um, feasibility um, of a market, its requirements and offerings on a ledger. So to what extent can this market, market run, operate, and operate in a way that's going to uh, deliver value creation on, this, on a particular ledger. The second fit is what's called token network fit, which is establishing the token across both the market and ledger layer to align incentives in the best interest of the network. And so there are two distinct fits that need to be sort of established here, but it's important to know that, that, that you know, 
you need both of these in order to sort of establish a, a, a viable token economy. Now, I'm just going to pull out a few things that are important pieces of uh, each phase. And, and in the discovery phase, as I mentioned, I mean, this is a phase where you need uh, considerable alignment um, within your team. Otherwise, you're going to be solving for different, slightly different problems. And what's going to happen is that you're just, you're not going to get it, you're not going to reach an optimal design. And so here's probably the best point to, to point out um, that the problems that are trying to be solved with via token economies are much more complex than a lot of the platforms that were created um, in Web 2.0 in, in the current internet. They're not simple problems. They're very sophisticated problems involving cryptography, um, economics, governance. And so you're not going to be able to actually come to a, a proper design bottom up. So these ideas around lean startup and design thinking and sort of building bottom up is very tough to do, especially since you're not going to have the, the same user base to start off with and test with. So... What you, what you need to do is you actually need to do, you do need to do some bottom-up work, but you actually need to combine it with some top-down work. And so what we did is we started to integrate some uh, strategic uh, consulting tools, you know, uh, firms like McKinsey um, who are solving complex problems for um, big companies. And we started to use some of their tools to kind of simplify really complex problems and create issue trees through what's called the MISI process. So you would start with a problem statement and then you would break it into sub-issues and you would use this process of um, applying mutually exclusive, completely collectively exhaustive. In this discovery phase, what you also want to do is you want to do a lot of work around understanding stakeholders and in particular, how value is exchanged between stakeholders. And so you have to go out, you have to build a taxonomy of actors, uh, both that are sort of, um, you know, very obvious, and then, you know, also contemplating, you know, what actors do you need to actually create? You know, you, you want to go out and sort of hypothesize what type of actors you might need. And so you want to create a taxonomy of actors. You want to understand value exchange between actors. What, is the relation, what are the relationships? And then you want to start to map out and play around with what are some of the, uh, how do we see value exchanging between um, these actors? And so this is an example of one of our portfolio companies that's created a, uh, a bot marketplace. Now, I won't get into it, but uh, it's an example. I could talk to you about it after if you want. Now, in the design phase, this is where you get into all of the fun stuff, right? Um, and there, I should say that there is this tendency for people to want to skip the discovery phase, right? Uh, because this is where the fun stuff is. But you do that at you, you kind of risk that at your own. Um, uh, you, you would be risking a lot of time saved by not um, doing the discovery phase. And so this is all the stuff that, that I'm sure everybody's been reading about, right? So mechanisms related to curation, proofs, identity, um, you know, markets, all the microeconomics, consensus algorithms. This is where you would come in and you would start to apply a lot of this work. But where, you really, but where you really want to get to uh, by the end of the design phase is actually a singular objective function for the network. So in the discovery phase, you're trying to nail down what the problem is that you're trying to solve. What's the goal of the network? By the time you get to the end of the design phase, what you want is you actually want to put that in mathematical terms, in computational terms. Like this is what the goal of this network is. And the truth is, is that even though there's a deployment phase, you know, this process is not linear, right? It's a, there's going to be this constant iteration of, of, 
of designing, validating, and optimizing throughout each phase. And so you want to get from these design constraints to this mathematical model, and then finally to the sort of minimal viable utility on this network that hopefully you could go out and um, launch as a mainnet. And so I'll just leave with one sort of important sort of distinction here. So everybody talks about crypto economics, but crypto economics is, is, is really just design. It's, it's economic design, it's all, this, the, all the fun stuff, it's monetary policy, it's game theoretics, you know, it's these debates about governance. But, the, you know, the other half of uh, designing and creating token ecosystems is token engineering. And so this is where, you know, you're going out, you're validating these principles, you're, 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 you're trying to optimize through machine learning, um, network science, you want to test for safety. This is actually the, the part of token ecosystem creation that as a community we don't focus on enough, but um, I do see a shift uh, in thinking. And so crypto economics is, is just half of, the, half of this work. The other half is token engineering. And so uh, I'll just leave everybody with, um, um, you know, this, this link or encourage everybody to, to download our handbook. Um, it's this work, this process is continually iterating, right? This is just the beginning of it. This is a framework. This is a foundation. And so over time, um, all of the great work that everybody else is doing in the community, they'll be able to kind of fill in you know, a lot of the blanks in this process, right? And there's a lot of things being figured out. And so I think the plan for us is to actually create a wiki around this to kind of continually update and sort of beef up this process. But I encourage everybody to check out token ecosystem creation. And uh, also just token engineering as a practice, as a discipline, uh, check out these meetups. These are meetups that we run uh, at Outlier um, here in Toronto and then also in London. Um, and, um, you know, I should also add that token engineering has chapters, you know, globally. So, um, I encourage everybody to check that out. And if any of you got questions, happy to answer them. Well, I think it's a good point. I think um, you want to be able to incentivize uh, more engagement, more activity, more partic participation. So um, it's great that we're we're putting we are at attributing stake to those behaviors, so that um, it's going to result in the right type of behaviors. But you know, how do we increase engagement? I think something like that is something you know I've thought about that all the time, right? So. Um, I'd like to see a network that is that is a little bit more progressive or, you know, disciplined around doing that. Now, you bring up another good point which, around taxation. Like taxation is a big mess, right? It's like, if you if you want to, um, I think regulation um, and taxation in North America is 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 a lot more problematic than it is in 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 other jurisdictions. I mean, Outlier is, um, we're headquartered in London and a lot of our portfolio investments are, you know, sort of Berlin-based, European-based. And so we don't face the same type of regulation, but 
those are really, really tough, complex problems. And what I would say is that, you know, you kind of answered your own question a little bit in there. You can create more sophisticated mechanisms, but then it also creates really, really complicated solutions for taxation, and it's already complicated for taxation. Um, in fact, yesterday we were having, I was having this conversation around, you know, some of these mechanisms, you look at something like Maker, they're so sophisticated that when a taxation lawyer sees it, um, they're trying to do taxation, they're trying to figure out the tax treatment between two guys that are, you know, keepers in their basement. And that same level of work is involved in doing the taxation for a very complex sort of deal between two companies. You know what I mean? So it's great that we're able to open source a lot of this stuff, but it's hard to uh, come, with, come up with simple, real-world solutions for regulation and taxation. It's just, you know, we're, we're dreaming up, like, really awesome uh, uh, solutions in this new digital world. But, but I think what's going to happen and what has to happen is both regulation and taxation is going to just have to adapt. There's going to be some, have to be some adaptive measures there. Or they're just going to have to start getting really granular about both regulation and taxation. And I actually have talked to some regulators in the, in the US where rather than looking at the network and trying to regulate a network, we start looking at actually the specific activities to find out what is the specific activity that is, that is a problem. And maybe they could figure out a way to, to uh, resolve that activity. I hope that answers your question. Yeah. Well, um, so I'll just sort of unpack a couple of things that you, you said there. So first of all, I think, um, I think you're, you're totally right on, um, uh, we, we design these so that everybody's sort of this rational actor and they're going to follow these, follow these sort of economic terms. And so, um, but not all actors are, are rational. In fact, you know, I was just talking about the current internet, and the current internet is like totally based on irrationality. Like, we 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 um, we sign up for all sorts of things. We don't care just because we want to get <laughs> we want the service, right? And so we this whole idea of user experience and experience design and this seamlessness that we're used to this is all irrational. It's all emotional. So we don't have that in in our um, in, in, in our blockchain community. We don't have that in, in sort of these blockchain solutions right now, which is, which is a big part of the reason um, why we don't have the type of adoption and you know you have the rest of the world kind of laughing, like, okay, when's this blockchain thing gonna happen, right? And so I, like, I, I have hypothesized that um, you know, one of the ways that tokens will, will become more mainstream is not because some, People are going to care about you know making 10% on a on a decred stake, but uh, but on the back of some really awesome um, tech, uh, technical uh, technologies, user experiences. Maybe it's something like um, 
we're able to digital twin you and, and combine it with uh, um, a, a VR experience and you're just going to be like, wow, this is amazing. Like, you know, I'm seeing myself and there's some sort of, you know, uh, token, token system attached to it. And that token system is just going to end up being this sort of underlying, under the hood kind of thing that you're doing because that's what you need to do to, <laughs> to be a part of this network. And then the values that these tokens are going to sort of espouse, right? This, these carrots and sticks, so to speak. That'll just sort of evolve over the next generation of users. It's not going to be rational. It's not going to be, okay, I, uh, you know, I'm, like I said, I'm going to make 10% on this. It's going to be the experience, and then there's going to, and I would imagine a token system that's sort of underpinning that experience is going to sort of open up tokens and a lot of those, the 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 values and principles that are associated with tokens, it's gonna we're gonna adopt those just the way we adopted with the initial internet. Um, this this sort of philosophy of democratizing information, um, you know, I, I think the the new sort of social principles will come out, you know, as a as a as a byproduct. Now, n examples. You know, uh, I would say uh, it's been long sort of understood that something like um, Numerai has had the highest sort of utility rate. So I'm not sure if you're familiar with Numerai, but, um, and I think they've kind of pivoted now to this, this other sort of predictions market, but they had a, a very, um, uh, of a token that was designed with very, very high utility. I think it was in the 60%, 60% range. So data scientists that were using Numerai were, were, were pretty much staking 60%. That's pretty, pretty awesome. Um, that's from my understanding. So, so that's an example of, of, uh, of a token that was like, you know, I would say highly utilized.